church. How's everyone doing? Wonderful to see you all. If you're new, I'm Jason, the pastor here at Meeting. Um, we have a very special Sunday, but just wanted to remind you the Alpha, is, uh, Alpha class is starting up, and if you're here and you're asking questions about God and what's Christianity, you've got a lot of curiosity about what it means to be a Christian, come on out to this class. I invite you to come and just seek and be with other, other people who are also asking. And if, and if you're here and you know Jesus, take a couple of these cards with you, and I guarantee God is going to bring you someone in your week to pass it out to and invite. So let's be praying for the Alpha starting up. And also, uh, thank you, Alejandro, for praying for Yanni's family. Just want to remind you also, in the back, we have the I Am community 
uh, selling some products, books, and um, uh, there's some crosses. You remember they came and shared uh, uh, for Christmas. So go and uh, take a look at the table in the back to pick up some gifts for Tet Holiday as maybe you're going to visit some people. It's a wonderful time to bring a gift. Well, we're going to take a break from our Exodus study, and I do want to remind you we have the Bible study in the back from last week, Exodus 32. Pick up a hard copy or download it on the website. But right now, I want to invite uh, three pastors visiting that are very close to our family. So can Pastor John, Sean, and Pastor Ray come on up? Let's welcome them to HIF. And as Alejandro shared, we had a wonderful men's uh, retreat yesterday. But um, share a little bit about yourself and also what we did yesterday. So, Thank you, Jason. So my name is John. I'm the disciple Jesus loved. <laughs> he loves all of you. He just loves me a little more. Don't, don't feel bad about it. Um, we are from California. Um, and we all serve at Maranatha Chapel, a church in San Diego that was uh, started by Pastor Ray, who's going to share it today. Uh, I serve as the missions pastor there, and so um, first met Jason and his wife Jill a little over two years ago, uh, because believe it or not, Jason has a, a God-fearing, devoted mother and father. They attend our church, and so about two and a half years ago, his mother found me and said, John, John, you have to meet my son and his wife, Jill. They're a beautiful family. They're serving in Hanoi. You guys need to get to know them. And uh, we did, and here we are. So it's been awesome to be here with you guys. We had a great time yesterday at the Men's Fellowship, uh, but I'll let Sean talk about that. Awesome. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, my name is Sean Stone. I'm, uh, my official title is Executive Pastor. I'm one of the teaching pastors at Maranatha Chapel. Um, and I love what you said. We, you just called it a men's retreat, but it's actually what well, you said, a men's advance, which I loved. You know, we're not retreating, we're going forward. We had a men's advance yesterday, which, I don't know, I thought was a great time. Uh, yeah, we get to share on the life of David yesterday. And for the guys that were there, John did a, gave a great word on, on being faithful in the small things. And I shared uh, on the importance of friendships, that we will never make it in life unless we learn to uh, make, grow, and cultivate friendships, godly friendships like David and Jonathan. I've been married almost 19 years. I've got three kids. Uh, 15, 16, and 17. Yeah, 15, 16, 17. So you can pray for me, three high school students. Thanks. Uh, the best decision of my life was giving my life over to Jesus Christ. The second best decision of my life was marrying a, a woman named Annie, who happened to be th this guy's daughter. So uh, this is my uh, father-in-law, who I get to serve alongside. He's uh, not just my father-in-law, my father, my spiritual father, and uh, so it's blessed to travel the world and share the gospel together. So, Amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. And I am Ray. And it's nice to meet you and be with you. So uh, I look forward to sharing with you this morning. So. And let me just uh, say to the men, um, if you want to get that teaching yesterday, it's on the YouTube HAF site. Uh, the service, obviously, we get that on Facebook. You can watch the service, but the yesterday's teaching is on the YouTube. And also, men who couldn't come, go in the back. Pastor Ray's got his book in the back. Um, you can grab that and take that home with you. Also, just... Um, I don't know, Pastor Ray, when you start talking, I, if you want to share briefly about your books, but Pastor Ray has a few books out um, on the Mountain of the Lord and uh, the Holy Land Key. You can see these on Amazon. Also, I just want to share right now Pastor Ray's uh, teaching materials. You can go on the internet and um, listen to his podcast. Uh, Pastor Ray has influenced me over the last 15, 16, 17 years as he's taught through the Word of God. So we're... Uh, in for a treat this morning. And let me just ask one question to each of you. What has been your first impression of Vietnam? And they've, as you know, dealing with jet lag in Vietnam is very hard, but I think what's great about Vietnam, we have the Cafe Suada, the iced coffee to overcome jet lag. So what is, just give us one impression of um, the last three days in Vietnam. Well, I believe, um, you know, coffee is the beverage of the Holy Spirit. Where the coffee is, the Holy Spirit flows. So I believe Vietnam is flowing with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Oh, uh, See, I was going to say something along those lines would be funny. I mean, yes, the food's amazing, but I, honestly, my first impression, this is our second time here, John and I, two and a half years ago, I, I've never met, honestly and sincerely, I know sometimes leaders get up and just try to flatter you, you know, but truthfully, I mean, some of the most genuine, sincere, authentic, and open and warm people as the Vietnamese people. That, that was my, my impression. 
um, well, this is my first time. I sent them, uh, you know, to co the first time, um, and you know, to make sure they came home alive, and they did. So I said, <laughs> I decided it's okay, it's safe to go to Vietnam. And then I came here, and they told you know what they came home and told me about. They go, wait till you drink the coffee. That's all they told me. So I came here, and I drank the coffee. I'm sold. I want to, <laughs> I want to be Vietnamese so I can drink coffee. <laughs> it's like magic. But the other thing is crossing the street. Yeah. <laughs> There's a game that we call Frogger where you kind of you get squished by cars. I was like, it's a, like you guys, it's a miracle you're alive. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay, I'm moving. So I noticed no one sat in the front row. Do not be afraid. We do not bite, even though I'm an American. So I'm going to move a little closer to be with you. Um, and, you know, just a brief overview uh, to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm 61 years old. No, 61 years young. It depends on how you look at it. Um, I got saved um, when I was 11 years old. Uh, how many of you have heard of a man named Billy Graham? Have you ever heard of Billy Graham? Yeah? So uh, there was a, uh, he, he didn't come personally, it was a movie about Billy Graham. And so I went to this movie about Billy Graham. Uh, I have two brothers, so our family wasn't going to church. We were not religious at that time. And uh, we used to have to work on Sunday. My dad made us do chores and the lawn and mowing the lawn and taking care of the yard. And I hated Sundays because of that. Um, but if we did our chores, Sunday afternoon we could go see a movie. And uh, with three boys, the movies we like to see, this, this takes me back, but uh, three boys we like to see James Bond, if you've ever, you know, ever watched a James Bond movie, or Clint Eastwood Spaghetti Westerns. So th there was none of those movies, and my mom was the only Christian in the family. She saw the Billy Graham film, and she, wanted, she knew we would hear the gospel. She goes, let's go see Billy Graham. We're, we're like, you know, who's Billy Graham? He talks about God. And we're like, ah, we don't want to see that. My dad was like, yeah, I got more work for you guys to do. We said, we, we want to see Billy Graham really, really bad. <laughs> So we end up going to the movie, and in the movie, you know, he presents the gospel. It's a young Billy Graham, uh, you know, he's got, he's tall, blonde-haired, piercing blue eyes, and a North Carolina accent. You need Christ. <laughs> well, I hope you'll come forward, and you can be saved and go to heaven forever, and have all your sins forgiven. Come forward now. So that's my best Billy Graham I'll just share with you right now. It's a little Billy Graham. So they gave an invitation. If you want this Jesus to come inside of your life, and I was going through a lot of things at the time, and uh, it pierced my heart. And they, you know, in a theater, they asked if you come forward. Um, so I got up and I walked forward. I, I was the only one who responded in the whole theater. And I've often wondered about the churches. You know, they rented the local theater, they advertised in the newspaper, they spent money. And only one little 11-year-old boy walked forward. I wonder if any of them thought, maybe that wasn't worth it. I'm here, I'm that boy, and I say, it was worth it. And with Jesus, it is worth it for even one. So there may be one who is here, and you're on a spiritual journey. I want you to know he's watching you. He knows you're here. He knows you're following or interested, and he loves you. So anyway, if you have a Bible, let's open it to uh, Psalm 133. We're going to go through that psalm. Very briefly, I, I did want to say that as I prayed for this church, Hanoi International uh, Fellowship, I just felt the Lord speak to my heart. Uh, to give you a little personal word, this church is very precious to the Lord in heaven. This church is known in heaven. And he's very pleased with you. Uh, you are highly favored, the apple of his eye. And in many ways, I believe this church is like 
the church of Antioch in the Bible. It's the first church outside of Israel. Um, and the first place they started calling followers of Jesus, Christians, was in the city of Antioch. From there, the apostle Paul was sent to go throughout the Roman world, which was, you know, they had their gods and goddesses that they had borrowed from the Greeks. And that's what people actually worshipped. So that, that, that out of that, there would be one God who is above all the gods, and, a, and that his kingdom is about a family, and that the creator God is a father and wants to know, be known as a father who has a son, who sent his son to the earth to invite us, who were made in his image, to join his royal family and to be sons and daughters. It was so unique, and it literally penetrated the, the whole Roman world was never the same. And it all came through Antioch. It was a sending place. And I believe that, uh, I know this is my first time here, but what I've seen, uh, just the other day, we were by Jason's office. Here we are at this church on this 17th floor of this high rise in Hanoi. And in walks a young Japanese mother uh, holding her precious little daughter. Uh, and, and a young man, I think maybe it was her brother or something, and she walks, to, she'd never been here before, saw the sign, there's a church on the 17th floor, she comes up here, she walks into his office and says, can someone please tell me about Jesus? I am falling in love with Jesus, but I need to know him. Can you help me? And Jesus is like, you've come to the right place, you know? So I feel that uh, in a way, this church is an Antioch that God will be bringing people from many different places, backgrounds, countries, uh, and maybe you're here for a short season or for a longer season, but you are a very special and chosen people. Amen? So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide us and speak to us that we might hear what the Spirit would say to everyone here. May all of your sons be blessed. May all of your daughters be blessed. May the good hand of the Lord come upon them. For any who are searching for you, I pray that they would have divine revelation. Open their eyes, their ears, and their hearts. You are very subtle, Lord. You're like the breath or the wind, a perception, a thought. But you are very real and very powerful and very supernatural. And so minister to each one according to their need. And it's in Jesus mighty and wonderful name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Okay, so the first, I'm going to give you a few life lessons on the, the outline here. So the first one is, there is no greater joy than to live in unity with our brothers and sisters. Um, this is one of the shortest psalms in the Bible. Psalm 133, verse 1, is written by a man named David. David was an ancient king of Israel. And um, it's a song, so it was also put to music. He is called a man after God's own heart. Here's what he wrote in verse 1. Behold, he's saying, look, pay attention, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, brothers and sisters, to dwell together in unity. Uh, so David is writing about, he's the king of the people of Israel, ancient Israel, they have 12 different tribes who come from the 12 sons of Jacob. Abraham, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Because to Abraham, there were many gods, uh, not only worshipped in ancient times, but there are many gods who are worshipped today. But as Abraham was searching and looking up, um, he wanted to know the true, the truth. And so the God above all gods... Um, came and revealed himself and said, uh, Abraham, I will bless, because you believe me. He gave him a promise because he saw a man who was sincere. I want to know the real God, the great God, the true God, the God who is above all gods. And God said, I'm going to bless you. And all, all the, I'm going to be your friend. Here's what it means to be the friend of God. God says, I will bless those who bless you. Anybody who loves you, blesses you, uh, wants to help you, because you're my friend Abraham, I will bless them. But if anybody tries to hurt you, harm you, or curse you, I will curse them. 
How many of you want to be God's friend? I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. God revealed himself to Abraham, who had a miraculous son, Isaac, and then uh, from him, Jacob, who had 12 sons. And then we come to the man named David. David was the king over two of the 12 tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin. He ruled from a place called Hebron for about seven years. Um, but the nation of Israel had become divided. There were 10 tribes to the north, and there were two tribes in the south, and they were basically in a civil war. But when David arrived, God united all the tribes. Uh, he united the kingdom. And David is writing, oh, how good and how pleasant it is. It fills you with a great goodness and pleasure when the family is together. What is interesting, if you've read the Bible from Genesis and forward, is you discover God's family did not always live in unity. If you go to the original family, Cain killed his brother Abel. Lot argued and quarreled with his uncle Abraham. Joseph uh, and his brothers hated him and sold him into slavery. Moses, the man where God literally revealed himself, the invisible God became visible for an entire generation. There were no atheists in the days of Moses because, because you could see God. And all the parents could tell their children, there he is. He's a pillar of fire at night. He's a cloud by day. But God is there. But Moses had a sister, an older sister named Miriam, an older brother named Aaron. And they criticized their brother. Uh, so there was division even in the family of Moses. Some of David's own sons would later turn against him. Jesus' own disciples began to argue with one another who would be greater than the other. And even in the New Testament, we find that there's arguing quarrels that are going on. So I want to go to the next uh, uh, slide here. The Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. This is from a prayer of Jesus. It's not what we call the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, but it's another prayer, and if you ever have a chance to read it, Sometime this week, I encourage you to read the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. It is the longest personal prayer of Jesus recorded in the Bible. Here's only two verses, but it's on the screen there. Let's read this out loud. But no, this is literally the, the words of Jesus praying. Let's pray it out loud. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus prayed for unity, the, the oneness that he had in his relationship with his heavenly Father. He says, I want that for you. I want that in my disciples. How many of you here this morning would agree that currently we live in a very, very politically divided world. Would you agree with that? Very divided. Even in my own country right now, in the United States of America, there are great divisions, great battles, great arguments, great division. But as God looks upon the earth, he wants, especially in times of great political division, for his family to stand out against that and be an expression of unity. One of the things that makes heaven, heaven, when we get there and walk its streets is, wow, there's nobody fighting, arguing, quarreling, debating. Um, there's unity in heaven. And, and that's what, so you get to relax and you get to enjoy all the beauties of heaven. Jesus prayed for that unity. How do we attain that unity? We know that that's God's will. And for believers, you know, th this church here in Antioch, uh, you've come from many different countries, many different backgrounds, many different places. But being united in Christ, there's a unity there that's very, very precious. But how do we can maintain that unity? Um, how did David bring unity? Because the tribes were fighting with one another. What David found, I want, to, I want you to go up to the next slide. Here's what David discovered. Here's after years and decades of Israel being in disunity, this is what David found would unite the tribes. He basically said, we, 
the 12 tribes of Israel have one common enemy. We all have one common enemy as believers. And the one common enemy that we have is the devil. The truth is that you and I don't have a lot of enemies. Um, we really have one common enemy. And your enemy is not the person sitting next to you. The person, you know, it is not your spouse. It is not your children. It is not your friend. It is, we have a real enemy, and that enemy is not within the family, and it's not within the tribes, it's outside. And David began to unite the tribes. They were all, every tribe had its own sign, they had their own standard, they had their own name, they had their own families, their own identity. This is my tribe, and I have pride in my tribe. And they would quarrel with the other tribes, criticize the other tribes. Now there was a great division among them. He says, listen, we live in a day where there are outside enemies who want to destroy all the 12 tribes. So we need to come together and be one. I need uh, every tribe. I need the tribe of Dan. I need the tribe of Ephraim. In many ways, we're all different here. Um, there are many tribes represented here. We're not all from the same tribe, especially in this church in Hanoi. And guess what? You have your tribe, you have your family, you have your traditions, you have your beliefs, you have your experience, but there are other tribes. And guess what? You need them. You need their gifts, you need their abilities, you need their personality, you need their perspective. You have something unique to bring. You give freely what God has given you. And then others share with you freely what God has given to them. And you put it together and the whole is always better, stronger, richer, and deeper when we appreciate and honor all of the tribes. Can I hear an amen on that? So unity, especially in Hanoi. Uh, love Hanoi. God loves Hanoi. God loves Vietnam. God loves uh, Southeast Asia. God loves this part of the world. He loves his church. But we can do much better as we come together in unity and realize that we have one common enemy. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. I will just mention, read it to you. Paul the Apostle is talking to the church. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, I, I'm going to just, I don't know how else to say it, but I will say it very simply. Uh, not only do we believe that, that Jesus is God, the Son of God, that became a man, but we believe that there are real angels, and there are real fallen angels that are known as demons. Uh, so human beings, we have our own issues, and we fight, and we quarrel, and we divide. But behind men, and behind even governments and politics, there are spirits that are, they, will, they want to destroy, they want to divide, they're, they're supernatural, and the supernatural world is, is really very, very true. So we need to recognize that enemy, we come together against him so that we can thrive. Okay, uh, let's go to the next life lesson, which is only verse 2. We only have three verses we're going to look at, so the next life lesson is this, from verse 2. We all have the anointing of one spirit. So Psalm 133, verse 2. After saying, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity, it is like, now David begins to describe how precious that unity is. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, or, and the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. So, let me just briefly share with you about what does this mean? And why would David talk about, uh, you know, this anointing uh, being an expression of unity? Oil in the Bible is symbolic in the natural world. By the way, everything in the natural world has a spiritual corollary. Everything that God created in the natural world is a window, portal, through which you can see supernatural truth and reality. Everything that God made, the sun by day, the moon by night, day and night, man and woman made in the image and after the likeness of God. So also oil. 
And they would anoint, uh, Aaron was the original high priest. Because, know this, when God first created Adam and Eve, do you know where we come from? It's in your human DNA. And every human being, doesn't matter what country or background or tradition you come from, all seven billion of us have within our physical DNA, do you know where we came from? A garden. We come from a garden called paradise. Beautiful and perfect. And there was no chaos. There was no division. And God was visible. And he walked with man on the top of a mountain. This beautiful garden this, that is called paradise. But because of sin, we got kicked out of the garden. Sin separates us from God. So the story from Genesis to Revelation and the story from the beginning of human history to this very hour is that every human spirit and every human soul is longing, searching, looking for where is that paradise, where is that garden. It's an emptiness inside of us that can only be filled with the presence of Christ and the Spirit of the Lord. So when they would anoint uh, the priest... It's a reminder of the, of the anointing that was in the garden, the presence of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Um, oil comes from shepherds and sheep. I don't know how much you know about shepherds and sheep, but um, oil is rubbed into a sheep's head. I'll tell you a few things about oil, and why I'm talking about oil is oil is a symbol in the natural of the Holy Spirit. You can learn, we can learn how to cooperate an experience. How many of you want to experience more of the supernatural presence of the Spirit of God? So this is, I'm going to explain in the natural, it has a spiritual meaning. So I'm going to tell you four things about oil. Number one, this oil that the high priest was anointed with has fragrance. A sign and symbol of the Spirit of God is there is a literal fragrance. And it's very sweet. And in fact, it is said it was made. God gave instructions uh, in the Old Testament exactly how to make the oil. This special anointing oil could not be used for any other purpose. Couldn't be used for cooking. Couldn't be used for candles. Couldn't be used for anything else. Only for anointing. And God gave the exact ingredients. And I believe that the fragrance, these natural elements created in the anointing oil was in the natural realm a picture of what it smelled like in the original Garden of Eden. It has a fragrance to it. Now, here's what's interesting. So a shepherd, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he says we are like his sheep. You know what a shepherd does? He, he puts the oil onto the head of the sheep. And guess what? The first thing the sheep experiences is the fragrance. And do you know that the fragrance, the aroma of this beautiful, rich oil it it's, smells very, very sweet. It's very comforting. The sheep just starts to relax. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He brings the sweetness of heaven. And you just feel like you're melting inside. You begin to relax inside. That's coming under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But guess what? The very fragrance that is sweet, aroma comforting to the sheep, is like bug repellent to the bugs. Uh, the, the flies, the insects, they can't stand the smell of that sweet fragrance. So it acts like a bug repellent. So also when you come under the anointing of the Spirit of God, it's sweet and comforting to you, but it bugs the demons that want to bring distress into your life. Number two, oil cleans. Just like oil cleans an engine, something about oil lifts and removes the dirt. So oil cleans us. It cleanses us. And it's clean for the sheep who's out in the dirt and the dust. It washes away all the dirt from his face. So the Spirit of the Lord will clean us. Thirdly, oil heals. When you're out in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of sheep and they get their face in the thorns and they get scratched there's no stores for healing, bomb, so th- they put oil on the, sc- on the little scrapes, and the oil heals. So the Holy Spirit heals our scars, heals our wounds, heals our soul, heals our hurts, heals our wounds. And then fourthly, it's comforting. The shepherd literally would massage 
the oil into the sheep. It's very thick, very rich. And how many of you like to get massaged? I mean, I like Vietnam. Everywhere you go, they give, well, you know, give you a massage and rub your feet or whatever. So that's what it's like coming under the Holy Spirit. You just feel like you're just being massaged from head to toe in the midst of all of that. That is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I want to I wanna just say this. Um, I have a, uh, a friend who is from Iran. He now lives in the United States in the uh, state of Texas. But in 1979, and a lot of you are quite young, so you won't remember this, but I do. In 1979, there was a revolution in Iran. And they wanted to get the Shah out, and they wanted to bring in Islam, strong Islam. And so there were many, many young people they were frustrated because they felt their government was taking advantage. The rich people always stay rich. The poor people are poor. So they're yelling down with Shaw. We hate Shaw. Death to America. Death to America. And my friend was one of those young college students. Yeah, we hate America. Death to America. Down with Shaw. He says, and so then they won. And they got rid of the Shaw, you know, and they, they got a new government in. But he was still a young man. And he goes, but... He goes, wow, I would really like to go to college in the United States. So maybe not death to America right now. Let's postpone that. So he comes to America. He is a young Iranian. He's learning English. He's going to college and university, experiencing a different culture. And he marries an American who was a backslidden Christian. But they started fighting with each other, and they started having troubles with each other. And... And she began to cry, and it was like they were going to get a divorce. And so all of a sudden, on one Sunday, he didn't know anything about it, but she says, I'm going to church. This guy's fine. He goes, I have fun. I get a couple hours off away from you. She goes to church, and she comes back. And little by little, she begins to change, and she says, something is happening, and I'm changing from the inside. And he goes, what? He goes, you can't be a Christian. I'm a Muslim. I'm, I'm from Iran. You can't be a Christian. He, he just said, this is impossible for you to do this. He goes, but then I thought about it and I went, you know, ever since she started going to church, she's been a lot better wife. So maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> so he lets her go to church for a while. And then... Um, one Sunday, he's having more troubles. He's battling in his mind. He's having thoughts of uh, ending his life. He's like, what's going on with me? And she goes, why don't you come to church? He goes, me? A Muslim? Come to a church? He goes, is that allowed? <laughs> she goes, yeah, it's allowed. He goes, okay, I'm coming, but I'm going to ask your pastor questions. And if he gives the wrong answer. So he came up with a legal pad and you know, the sermon, he didn't listen to anything the guy said. He's just waiting till the end. At the end, the pastor talks to a few people, and then he gets in front of him. He goes, oh, hi, yeah, I've met your wife, and it's nice to meet you, yeah, you know, Hormoz. And Hormoz says, I have questions for you. He goes, oh, okay, okay, what's your question? Question number one, is Muhammad God's prophet or no? So the pastor is like, is Muhammad God's prophet or no? And he's like thinking, what should I say? And he said, all of a sudden, it was like the spirit of the Lord fell upon him. And you know that because you just start to relax and you have peace. You have this inner calm. And then he's like, wow, Lord, it's you, your presence. What do you want, what do you want me to say? And the Lord said, don't answer that question. <laughs> so he goes, okay, that's a very interesting question you asked. But what's your next question? <laughs> so the guy, well, all right, my next question. Is the Quran the word of God or no? And these were the first two questions he asked. He said, if he had said either one, no, I was going to yell and scream, start throwing chairs. I was going to make a scene in that church like anything you've ever seen. So is the Quran the word of God or no? So again, he's like, now he knows that the presence of the Lord is with him. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to say? And the Lord says, don't answer that question. <laughs> so he goes, oh, that's a very interesting question. What's your next question? He goes, oh, well, so he goes, so... Hormoz is saying this, he goes, so he goes, I finally got, instead of a fight and a debate, I got to a real question I had for all Christians. He said, what's, what is this whole story of Jesus? Why did he have to go be beaten? Why did he have to go to the cross? Why did he have to suffer? Why did he have to die? The Holy Spirit fell upon the pastor. 
He said, you answer that question. And you share with him the gospel. And Hormoz, when he heard why Jesus came and why he died on the cross, he said it was like a, a burning hot awl went, pierced his heart and stuff started to open up inside of him. And he ends up becoming a believer. Now, now he gets so excited, he goes, wow, I've got all my family and my friends back in Iran. And they're kind of mad because the government's going one way. And he goes, really, from Shaw now to them, still the rich people are rich and we're still poor. And so things haven't changed like we thought it would. So he started doing TV shows. And now he beams in. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of Iranians who watch you know, the satellite TV. And they're curious and they're hungry about Jesus. So he has a call-in show. So he's talking to them. It's live. And he has a call-in show. And this one Iranian lady says, hey, uh, you know what? I don't believe in Jesus. And I don't believe in the gospel. And I think you're a liar. And you're deceiving people. And my mom is dying in the back room. And I'm a young woman. And I've tried hard to follow everything that is right. And nothing works. So I'm going I'm to commit suicide right now live on your show. Well, what he didn't, you know, all of a sudden they started getting these calls. People started calling all of their friends all over the nation of Iran. There's a girl that's going to commit suicide live on TV. You got to see, man, and with this Christian guy. And what's gonna... So Hermos is like, wow, what do I do, Lord? And he trusted in the Lord and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, well, he goes, I want you to, tell, I want you to just share the gospel with her. <laughs> and he said, the Lord gave me the weirdest thing. He says, okay, you've decided you're going to take your life. He goes, but would you, would you wait one week before you do that, make that decision? She goes, why, what? He goes, I want to lead you in a simple little prayer of asking Jesus to come inside of your heart and to fill you with his spirit and forgive you. She goes, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe he can forgive me. I don't believe anything that you're saying. You're a liar. He goes, well, look, you're going to commit suicide. It's going to be in a week. He goes, so if you, just, if you say the words and Jesus is not real, nothing will happen. But if, on the other hand, you pray those words and something happens, then maybe things will change. She goes, fine, what do you want me to say? So he starts leading her, dear Jesus, I admit, I'm lonely, I'm empty. Please forgive me of my sins. I need you. I open the door. So she just goes through, she's just saying the words. She gets done with the prayer of asking Jesus into her heart, and all of a sudden, she goes, what? She's, she's on camera, Everybody, all, you know, Iran's watching, and, and her mom is in the kitchen. Well, her mom was dying. She was like in hospice. She was like only, you know, hours away from dying. Her mom is up. She goes, and she <laughs> you could hear it on the TV. Mom, what are you doing? You're, you're dying. What are you doing in the kitchen? She goes, I don't know. You started talking to that guy. I started feeling better. I got up, and I'm going to make some dinner. She says, What? She, her mom got healed supernaturally, so then that girl got saved. And now all of Iran is seeing, hearing, and knowing our God is an awesome God. It's not just what you say, it is what really happens. When Jesus is alive and real, he comes. The supernatural is real. Can I hear an amen on that? We all have one anointing of one spirit. And uh, God brings us together in that way. So let's go to the last verse and we'll close up for this morning. So it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Life forevermore. I want you to know this. When you become one with your creator in unity, God commands a blessing. From heaven, he gets excited about unity. When we're separated from him, he wants us to be brought back into unity with him. He wants unity in your marriage, unity in your relationships. Even you are a spirit, a soul, and a body. And there needs to be unity in you for you to function and fulfill the happiness that God has given to you. Um, and I want to just say this. Uh, in the spirit, God wants unity, not uniformity. Unity, not uniformity. Um, in marriage, it's about unity, not uniformity. When I was a young man and I first got married, I was 20 years of age, I thought, if only, you know, I'm a pastor, I started pastoring at 20, I said, man, uh, you know, to my wife, Vicki, honey, if you'll just listen to me and do what I say and have unity, then everything will be good. 
Guess what? I discovered that my wife had a different idea of what unity is. You know what I'm saying? How many of you know that opposites attract? Opposites attract. And I'm a, I like, I, I get energized at night. My wife is a morning person. Um, you know, I like uh, certain things. She likes other things. We're very, very different. And it's funny because a lot of young couples will come in for counseling, for marriage or whatever. And so I ask them, so what do you have in common? Why do you think you should get married? And do you share anything in common? They go, oh, if you only knew. We love everything together. I go, well, tell me, like, we both love to go for long walks on the beach. I go, wow, I've never heard that before in my life. That's amazing. <laughs> we like good food and good music, and we like to hang out with one another. We're special. I go, wow, I think you are. So let me ask you another question. Have you had any differences, any disagreements? Have you had a fight yet? And they look at each other. Oh, he doesn't know. Other couples fight, but we don't fight. We love everything together. We're just one. We're very special. So I, I try to tell them, you know, maybe down the road somewhere you might have a disagreement, you know, that will come. You know what's funny is when they come back a year later after they've been married and she's sitting in one corner and he's <laughs> sitting in another corner and then you say, so uh, what, what are the things that, you know, that are differences? And they go, you don't have time. <laughs> what are the things that you are alike in? We don't know. We can't think of them anymore. So what happened to a year ago? And I tell them, you know what just happened? You got to know one another. And the reality is opposites attract. God will bring some, you think they're beautiful, which they are, handsome. But there's something inside of you that is drawn to their differentness. And God gives us, through those relationships, the ability to understand the difference between unity and uniformity. Unity is not about making them think like I think, feel like I feel, believe like I believe in every detail of, you know, copycat. But it's you are different and honoring that and letting them be special, letting them be unique, letting them be different. And I see it this way. And being humble and honoring the uniqueness, honoring the difference between one another and then you come together, and now you share. You love one another, honor one another, prefer one another, are humble with one another. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. So, last scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Let's read this out loud together. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Amen? Amen. Would you, would you all bow your heads and close your eyes? And I just want to pray for you. This morning, we'll ask the worship team to come up at this time. And <coughs> I wonder, what is the Lord wanting to say to you about unity in your relationships, unity in your home, unity uh, with your friends, unity at your work, unity maybe in your relationship with your spouse or children? Wherever there is unity, God in heaven commands a divine blessing. Or maybe you are lonely and empty and you're not really sure if there is any unity between you and God. But even as that young woman who just gave the opportunity for Jesus to enter into her heart, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and will open the door, I will come in. I love that. He pursues a relationship with us. He knocks on the door. He invites himself to into our hearts. But we have to invite him in. We have to open the door. He will not force it. Um, he's a gentleman. It takes two to have a relationship. Just because you're in love with someone doesn't mean they may be in love with you. So when two agree and when two come together to love one another, commit to one another, you can have a relationship. I just want you to know that on Jesus' side, he wants a relationship with you. He loves you. He's known you from the time you were conceived. He's thought about you before you were even created. He's been with you and will never leave you nor forsake you. And he wants to have an inside relationship when you give him that opportunity. Father, I thank you for those who are here this morning. Uh, I thank you for this church. I pray your anointing and blessing upon them. Bring to them a new level of appreciation of unity. This church is very much like an Antioch. 
a variety of people from a variety of different backgrounds brought together by one spirit at one time for one purpose, for your kingdom and for your glory. And I thank you even as that young Japanese mom came and said, please tell me more about Jesus. I'm falling in love with him. I need to know more about him. I thank you for the young Iranian uh, woman who was just so honest and so bold. There's nothing to live for. Ah, but will you give Jesus a chance? And Lord, when she said the prayer and opened her heart, you not only did you heal her mom, but you brought salvation. And to this day, she is bringing many Iranians into the experience of a personal relationship with the God above all gods, who is a father, who has a son, who invites us to be royal sons and daughters in a royal family and bring us back into the original garden of paradise and the garden of Eden. And so, Lord, may your spirit confirm all these things to our hearts this day. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Among my Redeemer lives.
may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.